Good morning. We are on our way to the Korean War Memorial Museum, and I want to say that I'm excited to go, but I don't know if like excited is the right term when you're going to that kind of place. Yeah, it's a good point. I think I'm curious to learn and definitely intrigued to see what we end up finding out, but obviously it could be not the most emotionally fun experience. Yeah, the DMZ definitely piqued my interest and I'm eager to learn more about the complex history and I guess I just want to understand the emotional toll because I think it's really important to educate yourself on these issues, especially since this is an ongoing geopolitical problem in the world. And the more awareness is about it, the better. And I know that in Canada, we definitely don't learn enough about the Korean War. So this will be a really good opportunity. We've arrived at the Korean War Memorial and I believe the museum is behind us. At least we're hoping so, otherwise we're in completely the wrong area. gone inside yet and there's an outdoor exhibition which is just full of disused military vehicles and it is nuts absolutely nuts like the sheer size of some of these especially when it comes to seeing like disused missiles like some of the planes that they used and things like that it's just it's it's crazy to think about and for someone who is interested in planes in general like me, I've absolutely found it fascinating to take a look at these military aircraft. This has been worth it to come here already just to see military equipment and vehicles. Another thing just to mention, even when we get inside, apparently the entirety of this is free as well. I guess they're just trying to promote education and awareness mm -hmm. and having something be free is a really good way to do that. 100%. represent the countries that participated in the Korean War and on each of them you will find the dates in which they participated in the war, the number of troops that they sent, how many were wounded and killed. So this acts as a really nice memorial. We decided to start by looking around the first floor because we really had no idea about any Korean history and there's exhibitions that start from BC and take you all the way up to the end of World War II. And it's really fascinating because it seems like this part of the world has been in almost an eternal state of conflict and struggle because first there were several different kingdoms within Korea that were fighting amongst themselves. Then they ended up needing to unify to then take on the likes of the Chinese, the Japanese, Russians, Mongols, and then band together again to make sure that they repelled colonial forces that they didn't want to be involved with in their country. And it seems like all of those sorts of wars were kind of off and on, even during the time of the Joseon Empire, which lasted for like 600 plus years. And then at that point, they then were taken over and occupied by the Japanese from 1910. But even then, they were still doing whatever they can to fight for independence up until the point where they kind of got the independence. And then they were divided into North and South by the Soviets and the Americans. What strikes me is just 
how much shared history North and South Korea have. Mm -hmm. It's well over 2,000 years of shared history, and it's only in the last 70 years that it's been divided. So I understand why the people here feel so passionately about reunification, because this division is so new. place to make a video so you'll just have to come here and experience this by yourself because it's 100% worth it but we've just finished up on the second level which basically picked up Korea's history from the end of World War II right to the signing of the armistice I'd say in 1953 and we talked about this in our last video but just as kind of a recap the U.S. dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945, which caused Japan to surrender. And because Japan was in control of Korea at the time, this kind of gave Korea its independence. But that was very short-lived because the victors of war were the allies. And basically, the USSR and U.S. decided to arbitrarily divide Korea into two along the 38th parallel, which ended with the USSR being in control of North Korea and it turned out to be communist, and then the US asserting its own power over the South, and the South ended up as democratic. This resulted in the North wanting to take over, reunify Korea, I guess, from their own perspective, and make it communist. And so with Stalin's support, as well as Mao Zedong's support in China, the North Koreans invaded the South, crossed over the 38th parallel, took over Seoul in 1950, and thus started the Korean War. And they beat back the South Korean troops to a very small pocket of Southeast Korea, kind of the area surrounding Busan, for a while until then the UN started to get involved and they started to then progressively gain more territory until they got very close to the Chinese border. Which is impressive because that meant that they retook Seoul, they took Pyongyang and really went far north. Absolutely. But when it started getting to the point where it appeared to potentially encroach on Chinese sovereignty, then that is when the Chinese got involved. And seemingly it would appear that peace could have potentially been achieved either by the North Koreans completely taking over the whole of the Korean Peninsula or when the South then beat the North back and could have potentially retaken the whole of Korea before the Chinese intervention, then that could have also been achieved as well. But because then the Chinese decided to then beat the unified UN, South Korean, and US and allied armies back to the 38th parallel, it then really led to a lot of potential talks over ceasefires, peace agreements, but meanwhile there were still a lot of skirmishes and a lot of battles that were happening in the background to all of this. And so as a result, really nothing came to fruition by way of diplomatic talks until about two years later, when everybody realized that everything was at a stalemate and really nothing was being gained and so at that point that was when the armistice was signed a demilitarized zone was established along those battlefront lines and it's continued on for the last 70 years up until about this point yeah to this day nothing changed they're still divided in the exact same place millions of lives were lost and one of the things i found interesting was that it wasn't even south korea who signed the armistice because it was designated as a un military slash 
peacekeeping action. The UN was seen to be acting on behalf of the Korean Republic. And that was kind of the final word on the whole thing. And the South just continued to have hope for reunification even to this day. But my big takeaway from this is had the US and USSR not stuck their nose where it didn't belong mm -hmm. at the end of World War II and just left Korea to its own devices, they would be independent and none of this would have happened. That's very true. It all seems like there are multiple points during even that three year period where there was potential hope for peace and a unified Korea, but other powers got involved and that's where it just muddied the waters, unfortunately. I'm just so impressed by this museum and the fact that it's all free, I think is really wonderful. It is great. And I think especially for tourists like us who really have only seen history through a Western lens and have never really been able to get a look into all of this from the Neolithic era and all that kind of stuff up to now. This has been a really good way to spend a few hours and really educate yourself on this part of the world, how it came to be and why it is the way it is now. Really cannot recommend this highly enough. This has been a very good start to the day. You should come here. Mm -hmm. Refueled, recaffeinated, and ready to explore the last of the palaces that we're going to be seeing in Seoul. So, this one is Gyok Sukhum Palace. It's another one of the five palaces from the Josun dynasty. Let's give it a look. In yet another attempt to break the bank, they are charging us one entire dollar per person to get in here. This is among the smaller palaces that was built during the Joseon dynasty. And like with the smaller palaces, then it wasn't initially reserved for the king as a residence. It was instead for members of the king's family. So we we're looking at uh, the princes and their family. So brothers, sisters, that kind of thing. However, during Japanese occupation of Korea, then there were times where the main palace was burnt down and during that restoration work then the king took up residence here. We've just been wandering through what is the king's sleeping quarters and it's not all that different from what we've seen at the other palaces. The colouring is the same on the buildings, the layout of the buildings are the same. The exception is this has some chandeliers which the others didn't. And I do believe we're going to see a little bit of a different style as we wander through the rest of this palace. And just like that, that is a wrap on the palaces that we are visiting in Seoul. We're going to go back to our Airbnb and we will pick up when we go out later this evening. Very excited for this. Welcome to Myeongdong Night Market. Apparently this runs every night in this part of Seoul and it's particularly famous for all of its street food. So we started off by having what they refer to as fish cakes. So this is what they look like. 
We've gone for a fish cake platter, which seems to be just a plethora of different things. So yeah, really, really intrigued to try this out. Got a little bit of chili sauce as well, so just gonna try this out. So that was basically like a, almost like a hot dog, but in a really, really thinly wrapped batter. So it tastes really, really light, and then on top of that, having the chili for a bit of added hit, it's really good. This comes to 5,001, so five dollars. But most of the other menu items are 4,001, so four dollars each. This honestly looks amazing and most of the food here looks utterly incredible. The only downside is because we're on a budget, there's only so much we can afford, so we've had to be very, very limited with our choices. However, got this thing, which is a pork belly skewer, costs 8,001, so $8. And literally, it is layered pork belly all the way down with some kind of a sauce. Whacked on a grill, blowtorch either side, and then given to me. So I'm very, very curious about this. Oh my god, that's fantastic. It is so tender, it melts in your mouth. The sauce that goes with it is superb. Yeah. Definitely made a good choice here. From my perspective, there is so much energy here. There are a huge amount of tourists and Korean people here. There's tons of food stalls everywhere you look. There are tons of stores as well, especially like Korean makeup stores. And as Nick alluded to, the prices of the food are not that cheap and we're on a budget. The most, I'd say, affordable things are chicken and pork, as well as basically some deep fried cheese dishes. Don't get me wrong, all of it looks amazing, but I don't eat chicken or pork. And then the things that I would love to have, like a lamb skewer, these shrimp skewers, or a lobster dish, they're all anywhere between eight and $20. And I just can't justify spending that when I'm still gonna need food after. There's no way it's gonna fill me up. So it's a really fun vibe, but you kind of need some money to come here, basically. We're just heading back to our Airbnb now, but please go to the Myeongdong Night Market. Don't let our lack of budget stop you from going. 100%. If we come to Korea with like twice the money we actually have, then we would have really gone to town on everything there. And that's based on the fact that actually the things that we did eat were delicious. So please don't let our experience taint your view of it. Just make sure that you come with sufficient budget to be able to enjoy the food because there is a lot of it and it is great. Yeah, everything we saw looked delicious and smelled 
fantastic. So we're gonna go call it a night now and we'll look forward to our last full day in Seoul tomorrow, which is very saddening, but some of the stuff we got lined up is very exciting. So until next time, take care. And keep smiling.